Welcome to Heaven, the Christian Hope, our Spring 2020 Sunday School class for Peace Church, taught by Todd Blanchheim and hosted today by myself, Joe Frazier. Today, we'll be discussing John's views on heaven, and we'll also see the impact they can have on us. Thanks for joining us. And for those that are joining us back from previous lessons, thanks for being brave souls. We've been basing much of our material on the book on heaven in the Theology and Community series edited by Christopher Morgan and Robert Peterson, as well as Alcorn's book on heaven. Today, the focus will be on John's theology, as I indicated, and that's a section that's done by Andreas Kostenberger, Heaven in John's Gospel and Revelation. So while we've been using the categories of these eras of heaven and earth's history as we walk through different aspects of understanding heaven, this session will focus mainly on the perfection part and recovering that with the new heavens and the new earth and the regeneration aspect, where we'll talk about heaven as it presently presents itself prior to the final consummation. Last week, we talked about Paul's views on heaven and saw that he grounded his theology thoroughly in the Old Testament, that he wrote deeply on the notion of already and not yet part of understanding of heaven, sometimes referenced as inaugurated eschatology. Then we talked about the immediate state and then the final state of the consummated heaven. We'll see a pretty large overlap between those concepts and what we see discussed in John. In particular, we'll discover that the primary focus of John's gospel is on the present state of heaven, where God is worshipped and is preparing a place for believers to join him, while in the revelation of John, There's more of a focus on the end state, where the culmination of God's redemptive plan is a fully restored, renewed people, and creation is free from sin. As I indicated, we'll notice a number of overlapping themes between Paul and John's thoughts on heaven. We'll see some similar discussion on the already and not yet. We'll look at how heaven is already inaugurated by Christ, how heaven breaks into earth through Jesus. And God provides a glimpse into the future state of heaven as his salvific plan comes to completion and consummation in Jesus coming again, our bodily resurrection, and heaven being restored. So while we'll see very similar themes, we'll see a different perspective on what we've seen from Paul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with us this day, that we would learn more of you that you would help us to gain a deeper understanding of heaven and use that understanding to mold us closer to yourself, to help us to hold firm in difficult circumstances in the knowledge that you have prepared a place for us and that we have a place that is our home to which we belong, that you will bring us there fully redeemed, fully restored, made new. Lord, we ask that you would help us to have that word abide deeply in us, that we may remain confident in difficult times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this point, I get what you're really thinking. You're thinking, you know, I've listened to Joe drone on about Paul's thinking on heaven. Why on earth should I allow him to drag me into more about John's thinking, given there's so much overlap and so many similar themes? Well, there are a number of reasons. One, of course, is from Paul himself, when in Philippians he says essentially that going over the same thing can be helpful, albeit in a little more articulate way. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you, in Philippians 3.1. Now, it's not just repetition, though. If we think about the whole discussion, heaven is our end goal. It's our telos. It's our purpose. As a myriad of productivity pundits will tell you, you need to know what your goals are and move towards those goals. Our goal and our purpose is Christ, Christ in heaven. Besides all that, some of what we'll talk about impacts on, as Schaefer puts it, how should then we live? 
We live not only in light of the good news, in light of the gospel, but also in light of what's currently true in heaven for us now and in the future. When we look at dealing with challenges, and the world's going through a really big one right now, holding on to a clear vision of heaven can really help us through those times. And like an infinitely multifaceted gem, appreciating God from different perspectives and different attributes will take an eternity. Similarly, really understanding heaven and its full purpose for us is worth a deeper study. But the best reasons for hanging in there are the very reasons we can derive from John for the reasons God revealed to him more about heaven. It's to comfort and encourage. So we're going through some challenges now, but Christians throughout all time have been challenged and many persecuted. There's a lot of suffering throughout the world, and we all suffer in some way. God's promised great eschatological reversal, where the last will be first and the first last, comforts believers while they wait for, quote, the final return of Christ and the consummation of God's salvific plan. It also allows us to motivate and warn believers. Hold fast. Don't weary of the race and fight against sin. This vision of heaven helps to motivate our obedience and to warn against compromise to sin. And finally, to invite others. There is an invitation even in the Revelation of John. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. In Revelation 22.17 This is an invitation to trust in the one who fulfills these promises, and those who may not know him may learn of his promises and come to trust him through those promises. Finally, as noted here, God uses John to provide some of the clearest statements on our relation to present heaven and the richest description of the future consummated state of heaven. So, more talking head, or even not head, just voice. But I think it's worthwhile for us to walk through these to get that deeper knowledge. Of course, if you don't want to listen to Joe drone on again, there's always reading that section from Morgan and Peterson's book, Heaven. As I previously alluded, John's perspective on heaven in the gospel and revelation become focused on two pieces, mainly the present relationship of heaven to us heaven being God's abode, his dwelling place. And then in Revelation, focused on the end state that we mentioned previously when we talked about Paul, the final consummation of God's salvific plan that brings us bodily resurrected into heaven in his full presence in a fully restored creation. In John's Gospel, there's an emphasis on what's sometimes referenced as realized eschatology. It's an emphasis on the present state of God with us now, and especially as Jesus brings in heaven and we are part of it even now. That's not to say he doesn't recognize that as Jesus brings heaven into earth, when he comes to earth, that there isn't something more to happen even after Jesus' resurrection, after his death. So he does understand that already, not yet. It's still apparent, but there's just more of an emphasis on God breaking through to us. There's also an emphasis on restoration and recreation of Eden, of moving back to those initial promises. In fact, we'll see that there's a very strong parallel between what's in the revelation of John in terms of what God brings us to, to what God promised in the beginning, and the reversal of the curses that were laid down on us when Adam disobeyed. That's really the focus. Present state with God, what will be when God's plan is fully realized, how believers are impacted now in their relation to heaven, and a strong tie-in to the failure in Genesis and the restoration, and the revelation of John. Finally, after much ado, we get to the meat of John's views on heaven. In the Gospel of John, we look at heaven breaking into our world, and we'll see that as Martha comes to talk to him about her brother Lazarus. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. 
Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Notes from the ESV Study Bible indicate Martha's affirmation of end-time resurrection was in keeping with the beliefs of the Pharisees and the majority of first-century Jews, as well as the teaching of Jesus. Martha misunderstood the full import of Jesus' promise, thinking he was merely speaking of the final resurrection, while Jesus meant much more. Kostenberger goes on to write, Likewise, when Mary affirms her belief in the future resurrection on the last day, Jesus astoundingly claims that in his own person, the resurrection of the dead was present at that very moment, and that those who believe in him will experience it at the present time. In fact, in John's narrative, Martha represents conventional Jewish eschatology focused on the future, while Jesus points out the realized aspect. Elsewhere, John affirms the eternal life of the future new age, heaven, has already begun for those who believe in Jesus. See John 5, 24, 10, 10, and 17, 3. Thus, John represents Jesus as saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment and has passed from death to life. 524. This emphasis on the beginning of eternal life in the present, commonly dubbed realized eschatology, has led some scholars to conclude that John had no conception of a future heaven where believers would someday live. Rudolf Bultmann and C.H. Dodd, for different reasons, both famously argued that John had no future eschatology. That is, that John did not believe in anything similar to a future heaven for believers, but rather held to a fully realized eschatology. Boltman attributed references to a future resurrection, 528 through 29, 639, 40, 44, 54, to a later ecclesiastical redactor, while Dodd conceived of the gospel's realized eschatology as a way to deal with the unforeseen delay in Christ's second coming. However, these proposals have not carried the day, and subsequent scholarship has rejected the thesis of a radically realized Johnian eschatology. Instead, it is now widely believed that Jesus taught a form of inaugurated eschatology that holds present and future aspects of Jesus' end-time teachings in proper tension. Inaugurated eschatology posits that the kingdom of God, the age to come, and eternal life have already begun through Jesus' earthly ministry, yet still await final consummation at a future time when believers will fully live in the age to come, that is, God's new creation. In and through Christ, believers have access to end-time blessings, to heaven, and to God's throne already in the here and now. Yet, they still long for the future day when their mortal bodies will be completely transformed and they will dwell forever in God's presence, the Father's house. So this is a little bit of a tricky distinction, but there's no sense in John that there's nothing yet to happen after Jesus' initial coming to earth and dying on the cross. In fact, we see, of course, in the revelation of John that there's more to happen later on. And I think this ties in, if we think about it, first century Jews were expecting a militaristic Messiah who would overthrow the Romans. Many also expected that when the New Age was inaugurated, it would also be the consummation of God's redemptive plan, that there's no delay. That's sort of like Daniel thinking, if you remember our study on Daniel, that when we return to Jerusalem at the end of the Babylonian captivity promised by Jeremiah, that the new age would be fully ushered in and consummated. And in the dream that answers his prayer for that return, Gabriel makes clear that there will be a period of time between returning to Jerusalem and the consummation of God's plan. 
just as we have passages that belied the idea that the Messiah was a military conqueror, such as the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, so too we have passages that indicate the period of time between the inauguration of the New Age and its consummation, like those from Daniel. As we note, Jesus does not merely say that he will bring about the resurrection or that he will be the cause of the resurrection, both of which are true, but something much stronger. I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection from the dead and genuine eternal life and fellowship with God are so closely tied to Jesus that they are embodied in him and can be found only in relationship to him. Therefore, believes in me implies personal trust in Christ. The preposition translated in is striking, for ordinarily it means into. Given the sense that genuine faith in Christ, in a sense, brings people into Christ so that they rest in and become united with Christ, we see that same expression found many times, for example, 316, 1836, and 635, 738, and others, where the I am statement represents a claim to deity. So God, in the form of Jesus, is so tied to the resurrection and the belief in him that he embodies the resurrection for us. Another aspect of how heaven is presently with us is how God is presently preparing for his family to join him on his estate. In the culture of first century Jews, it was typical, for example, for a son to build on to the family house or the family estate and bring in his family into that estate. That's the notion here, that Jesus is preparing a place for his family to come and join him that that's happening in heaven. The only other occurrence of the word room or single dwelling in the New Testament is found in John 14, 23, where Jesus promises that he and his Father will make their home within those who love him. We are his home. He dwells in us even as we live in him. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you myself, that where I am, you may be also. There is a period of time when he goes and prepares a place and the time when we join him. So another clear indication that there is this idea of inaugurated eschatology in John. As Kostenberger summarizes, John's gospel presents heaven primarily as the present abode and dwelling place of God the Father. In and through Jesus' ministry, heaven is opened and in a very real sense comes down to earth. Through the indwelling and empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit, believers experience eternal life in the present as a foretaste of their final, eternal, joyous dwelling in God's new creation. What is more, John describes the future state of believers as an extended household, comforting his followers by guaranteeing them a future place in God's own realm and abode. The heaven where God now dwells, the Father's house, was made known and rendered accessible to humankind in and through Jesus as mediated by the Holy Spirit. And one day, in the future, believers will have full access to the Father when they forever dwell with Him in His house and abode. Now we'll turn our attention to the revelation of John and a deeper look at our future in heaven, starting with Revelation 21, 1-4. through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Kotzenberger really highlights the core of the perspicuity of the scriptures, that is, the clarity of them, in this passage. You might think, wow, is this really a best example of the clearest passage in the Bible? But it's a great passage to really highlight how the Bible gets across what we need. Kotzenberger says, despite the highly figurative description of believers' future state in these final visions, it is possible to register several definitive affirmations. The future life of believers and their resurrection bodies will entail life in God's new creation, the direct presence of God with humanity, the permanent removal of all pain, sorrow, and suffering of the present world, ultimate security, safety, and protection, and a reversal of the effects of the curse in the fall. So we can really hold those truths however we interpret some of the details about what all this looks like. First, we'll see that this really is a new creation, a new earth. It is a recreation of what Eden ought to be for us. God is praised throughout Revelation because he created all things, and by extension, we celebrate God's power and ability to create in his ability to recreate, renew, and make whole. And so we'll see this new heaven and new earth recreated without sin and full. Now, this doesn't just affect our future state. It's clear here, and if we compare Revelation 21.1 to 2 Corinthians 5.17, which states, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So in that case, it's talking about making us new. And in this case, it's talking about making creation new. So this clear idea that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit shows that the new creation seen by John has already broken into the present old creation. We who are united to Christ by faith, symbolized by our baptism into him, become part of this new creation even as we live in this broken, fallen, old creation, this present world. We live in this tension between what has already been done and the not yet that we've described before. By God's grace and his spirit, we are being inwardly transformed day by day into Christ's likeness. We still live in this broken world filled with temptation, sin, suffering, pain, and death, but we long for that final consummation at the return of Christ. Believers now have access to the throne of grace. We now have access to the Holy Spirit. There is so much that is new. And yet, as we all too well know, we live in this broken world. And even our access is as through a mirror darkly. We have our sin that's still living in the old man in us that puts a veil between us and being able to see God fully. Yet there we will see him face to face. There we'll have direct access. Right now, if we were to be fully in God's presence, it would be fatal to us because we are sinful still. While Jesus has put us in a state of righteousness before God, we cling to the old man all too often, and in heaven that will no longer be the case. In our new, fully restored state, we will no longer cause pain to one another or sorrow. Every tear will be gone. This picture isn't just that tears will disappear, however, but that our Lord will himself wipe them away. The tenderness of our Lord is shown in how deeply and intimately he cares for us. There'll be no more reason for mourning or crying or pain, and all the heartache that we know too well will be released. It's hard to picture this, honestly. It is, however, such a beautiful picture of our Lord and what he has in store for us. We also see that God 
fulfills his promises and reverses both the effects of sin and also the checks against sin. For example, in Genesis 2, God planted in the Garden of Eden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as well as all the trees that were pleasant, with rivers flowing through Eden. We're presented with a similar picture in the New Jerusalem, but here the tree of life is available to everybody. Whereas It was previously forbidden for Adam and Eve in the garden, where God commands that the day in which they shall eat of it, they'll surely die. Now there will be no more death. Now we will have full access to the tree of life. We will see other fulfilled promises, such as having our names in the book of life and shining bright, as given in Daniel 12, 1-4. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been seen since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What was cursed, such as the creation over which we were caretakers, is also now renewed. We see this in the description of the new heavens and the new earth, especially unfolding in the description of the river of life in Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So we get this picture of this lush, rich world and how that's a restored world made new where previously the ground was cursed. Right now, people may not feel fully secure. How the coronavirus will play out plagues our future on earth and many worry. It is precisely in these times that Christians can cling to the promised safety and security of our heavenly home. In Revelation 21, we see this promise viscerally described. Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And the measured city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold like glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, 
The description continues, but we see that this is a very safe fortress on a high mountain with walls that are over 200 feet high, where every gate is guarded by angels. But the funny thing is, there is now no more enemy. The gates are open. There is nothing to worry about. This safe fortress has no enemy to defend against. It is safe and secure. There is no shadow of worry or a reason for more tears. It is a place where all the curses are reversed. The earth is now released from its groaning for this very moment. It is set free. Man is back in his role of ruling over and caretaking of the new creation without the hindrance of sin. That for which we were designed finally comes to fruition. Kostenberger summarizes, As we look at both the Gospel of John and Revelation, they consistently employ the word heaven to describe either the present abode and dwelling place of God or the physical sky. The Gospel of John makes a distinctive contribution emphasizing the joining of heaven and earth in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ, in the present experience of eternal life available to believers through the Holy Spirit. Revelation makes a distinctive contribution by describing God's future eternal new creation as a permanent joining of heaven and earth whereby God's dwelling place and abode will merge with that of man and will result in his direct presence in and among his people. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing us this special revelation, a clear picture of your heaven. Even though much of it is symbolic and we may not get all the details, we see such a beautiful picture of the reversal of all curses, the direct access to you, the return to our designed purpose of being caretakers of your creation. We ask that you would encourage our hearts in the midst of all the challenges by clinging on to this picture of what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now for your favorite part, the photo credits. Thanks again for joining us and look forward to next week and Todd Blonshine.